Greetings. Grace and peace to you on this first weekend in April and on this Palm Sunday. It's a day that we remember the triumphal entry of Jesus into Jerusalem and, and the series of events that that, that precipitates, including uh, his last supper with his friends, his, his arrest and so-called trial, his crucifixion and death, and ultimately his resurrection. The rhythms of this story, while so uh, familiar to us, may have the opportunity to speak to us and to our current situation with new power this year as we hear these stories in a new context. And so as you participate in this worship service together through the gifts of technology that allow us to do so, I invite you to consider how this familiar, well-worn story of Palm Sunday might ring true in a new way for us this year. If we were in our our sanctuary today, we would, of course, hand out palms and uh, you would likely hold that palm and and wave it at the appropriate time and and do the whole routine. But, But would you really consider what it means to cry out, Hosanna? Will you, in this time together, join with the great parade of witnesses, those who have gone before us and those who are connected with us in this unique moment around the world, to say, Hosanna, with new conviction. Lord, save us. Today, our children are going to call us to worship. And we hope that you'll join them in expectation that even as we worship in this less than ideal way, that Jesus comes to us yet again, right where we are. Jesus is coming! Jesus is coming! Can it really be happening? Could he really be coming this way? Hosanna! Hosanna! Jesus is king! Where is he? We want to see him! Jesus is the king who comes to us. He's coming! He's coming! Hosanna! Let us lift our voices in praise of Jesus! Salve! 
Now would you join with me in this prayer of confession. O triumphant God, while we rejoice in the power of this story, we also confess our role in it. We confess to you our frequent turning away. We turn away from talking with you to talking about you. We turn away from your call to discipleship to our own work of self-preservation. We turn away from hope in your salvation to fear, despair, and denial. We turn from the freedom of love and relationship to which you call us to that which we can control, rules and doctrines and categories. Forgive us, we pray. Save us from our sin and from ourselves. In Jesus' name, amen. In the name of Jesus, we are all forgiven. May the peace of Christ be with you. And let us now share that peace with one another. Those who are gathered with you, wherever you are participating in this opportunity, or those who are on your hearts and minds this day, would you extend the peace of Christ to those? The Sunday School and Choir children have been learning this song to sing on Palm Sunday, and we invite them and you to sing along from home. Hosanna, blessed is he, Hosanna, blessed is he, who comes, who comes, who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna, blessed is he, Hosanna, blessed is he, who comes, who comes, who comes in the name of the Lord. 
Hi kids. I invite you to join me for the children's message today. Come a little closer, come sit on the floor. I have some questions for you. I wonder if you have ever heard about something called the Dawn Chorus. I actually just learned about it this week. I don't know if you've noticed, but every morning, just before sunrise, the birds start to sing. Lately, I have heard and, and seen more and more birds each day. Robins, blue jays, cardinals, goldfinches, and other birds I don't even know the names for. I hear them calling to each other, singing songs, looking for worms, gathering bits for their nests. Have you noticed some of these birds? Have you heard their songs? Sometimes their songs or, or calls aren't very loud. Sometimes their voices are small and quiet. They're hard to notice. Often, at least for me, I hear their songs, but I don't always know the names of the birds. And I wonder to myself, what bird makes this song? On Palm Sunday, we remember how the people in the streets, they called out to Jesus. We don't know many of their names. We don't know many of the names of the people who were on the streets that day. The scriptures say that it was a large crowd who, who spread out their cloaks and who cut down palm branches. They sang, Hosanna, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. The people were singing with joy and praise. Hosanna is a word of praise. I wonder how we might sing praise to God. What are the words that we would use? Just as the large crowd in the streets sang Hosanna as Jesus rode through the street on a donkey, so we can give our thanks. We can share our joy with Jesus today. Jesus came to save us. God is with us today, no matter where we find ourselves. In what small or big ways can you express joy or thanks to God today? The song of the birds is small, but when they join together in the dawn chorus, it is beautiful. It is a gift to all of those who listen. So are the songs and the praises and the joys and the thanks that we have. Let them be a beautiful gift to the one who saves us. Amen. Our scripture lesson today comes from the gospel according to Matthew from chapter 21. When they had come near Jerusalem and had reached Bethphage at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples saying to them, go into the village ahead of you and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, just say this, the Lord needs them, and he will send them immediately. This took place to fulfill what had been spoken through the prophet, saying, Tell the daughter of Zion, Look, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and put their cloaks on them, and Jesus sat on them. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and that followed were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David! Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord! Hosanna in the highest heaven! When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was in turmoil, asking, Who is this? The crowds were saying, This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee. May God add a blessing to our hearing and understanding of this word for us today. Thanks be to God. And now would you join me in a moment of silent prayer. O oh God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts across the distances that separate us 
and the screens that connect us be acceptable unto you, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. How long? Have you found yourself asking that question recently? How long? Like, how long will this go on? How long will it be until we can worship together again, until we can shake hands, until we can watch a baseball game, until we can be together? How long? How long until we go back to school, back to work, back to normal? How long until we go back? How long? This how long question is not one that we have recently invented. It's an age-old question that has found resonance across the millennia, wherever people have faced difficulty. It isn't a question of the faithless, but a question of the faithful, as it is a question directed to someone. We ask God, maybe not even expecting an answer so much as just wanting to express the question, how long will it be like this, O Lord? How long? Questions like this are are what we've been talking about all through this season of Lent. In a sermon series, we prepared long before uh, the coronavirus was a term that we all knew. We wanted to talk about how our faith naturally leaves us with questions. Questions that demand that we wrestle and, and engage in conversation with God. Questions that demand that we remain unsatisfied with pat answers or folk religion. Questions that demand that we continue in relationship. There is a tendency to think that the nature of faith is to have an answer for everything. And we've seen that temptation arise again in this current season. As I, I don't know if you've seen them, but I've seen uh, Facebook posts and, and emails and other things that have, that have suggested that the coronavirus is God's way of, of punishing us, maybe for, for putting sports before God or for making an idol of our economy. People will come up with all sorts of reasons to avoid difficult questions that don't have neat and tidy answers. But faith has never really been about providing easy answers to complex situations. In an article on Time Magazine's website this week, I read this line that explains really exactly why we've been talking about questions all through the season of Lent. It says this, It is no part of the Christian vocation, then, to be able to explain what's happening and why. In fact, it is part of the Christian vocation not to be able to explain and to lament instead. You see, friends, this faith of ours isn't about neat and tidy answers, but about living faithfully in the midst of the tensions and the troubles. It's about leaning into a relationship of love in the midst of uncertainty, doubt, and fear. It isn't about explaining away our problems, but looking to God in the midst of our problems. And that is really what is meant by the word lament. You can find these kinds of laments Uh, as a part of our faith tradition. Look at the Psalms, which are full of laments, full of difficult questions raised to God in difficult times. Psalm 44, for example, says, Why do you sleep, O Lord? Wake up and remember us. Psalm 13 says, Have you forsaken me, O God? Psalm 22, which was quoted by Jesus on the cross, says, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Do these sound like the neat and tidy answers of a, of a doctrine, of a statement of belief, or, or of a religious system? They certainly don't. They sound more like impassioned uncertainty, questions that are asked with a, with a fear and trembling, questions that are asked with a, a twinge of doubt or, or anger or exhaustion, yet still directed at a God who presumably can hear us and help us. These are the questions of a real faith lived out in real situations. It's the kind of faith that I hope and pray you're living out 
in the midst of this very real situation in which we find ourselves. It's the kind of faith that we can see in our story from the Gospel of Matthew today. You heard the story. Jesus is entering into Jerusalem, and the moment is charged with all sorts of electricity. There's, there's been some sense that, that he's been building up to this, that Jerusalem is the, the center of the Jewish life and faith, especially as Jews from, from all over the region have gathered together for the celebration of the Passover. And there's also this juxtaposition uh, with Jesus' entry into Jerusalem with that of Pilate who also is entering into, into town during the Passover to make sure that the Jews remember who is really in charge during the celebration. A political kind of parade that would have been complete with, with armor and weapons and shows of, of power and pageantry. In contrast, of course, Jesus enters on a, on a little old donkey with, with palm branches and peasant robes. And he enters to shouts of Hosanna, a word we repeat today without really knowing what we are saying. It's a word that means save us. And it is a cry to God, much like the Psalms I mentioned a moment ago. As Jesus entered the scene, the people cried out, save us, O Lord, save us. What do you think they needed saved from? For that matter, what do we need saved from? And who does the saving? And in the end, who gets saved? That's the question I've lifted up from the text today. Who will be saved? Because it's a question I've heard asked over and over again. It's a question that I've heard people of, of faith ask about people of other religions, about people of no religion, about nominal Christians, about the LGBTQ community, and about just, just about every other kind of other that you can think of. Who will be saved, we ask, with a thought usually toward the end times, with a concern for eternity. When this question is asked, it, it's often framed in terms of, you know, St. Peter at the pearly gates or the book of life or some sense of ultimate judgment. But I want to invite you to rethink the question today. The Hosanna cries of Palm Sunday, the cries of people shouting out, save us, Lord, were not cries about the sweet by and by, but were cries about the here and now. For them, it was save us from Rome, save us from, from Caesar, save us from, from, from taxation beyond what we can bear, save us from, from oppression. Maybe in our modern context, it's cries of save us from the way we are destroying our planet. Save us from the, the gargantuan disparity between the, the rich and the poor. Save us from the polarization that divides us. Save us from the racism that sustains systems that keep some people held down and provides privilege to others. Save us from our fear and our anxiety in the midst of this pandemic. Save us from our loneliness, our, our sense of isolation. Save us from this virus. Save us, O oh Lord. Hosanna. This saving, this Hosanna shouting, it isn't about streets of gold or, or uh, harp playing cherubs. It's a very real cry for justice and for hope and for provision and for basic rights and for a life that is sustainable and dignified and just and right and good. See, the ancient Hosanna story, the Palm Sunday story, is our story too. Hopefully we can see that now, in the midst of this moment in particular, in the midst of our own laments. As we cry out, how long, O Lord, can we also cry out together, Hosanna, save us, Lord? And if we cry it out, and if they cry out in a small home in Italy, and in an apartment complex in Beijing, and if they cry out in the homeless shelters of London, and if they cry out in refugee camps in Kenya, and if they cry out in, in overpacked hospitals and, and under-equipped testing centers, and if they cry out in English or in Mandarin or in Arabic or Spanish, will they be heard? Will God save them? I return to the question at hand today. Who will be saved? 
we remember that the story we read today sets in motion a series of events that result in the crucifixion of Jesus only days later. And we may be led to consider that some of the same ones who shouted, save us, were disappointed with the approach Jesus took, hoping that he would just step up and, and lead a revolt, but discovering that he remained humble and quiet and nonviolent. They abandoned their cries of save us for cries of crucify him. How quickly can we change our minds when things don't go the way we want? when God doesn't answer our prayers the way we expect, the way we demand? Are we so quick to grow angry or bitter, to reject the way of humility, the way of patience, the way of love? Jesus' way was indeed the way of love. He didn't fix everyone's problems in a whirl of magic or a display of power, but instead humbled himself and let himself be handed over to the very systems that perpetuate fear and hate and prejudice and polarization, and those systems killed him. On the cross, you may remember that in addition to quoting Psalm 22 and saying, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? A lament that, that, once again, doesn't betray a faithlessness, but instead displays a profoundly deep relationship with God. You may remember that he also said, Father, forgive them, because they do not know what they are doing. As he died, crucified by the brokenness of humanity, he asked for our forgiveness. He was seeking to save us all, even then. One assumes that the forgiveness he prayed for was for Peter, who denied him, and for Judas, who betrayed him, and for the thief next to him, and for the religious leaders who were threatened by him, and for the friends who so quickly abandoned him, and for those who chose not to believe in him, and for the ones who spoke Hebrew, and, and for the ones who spoke Latin, and for the ones who spoke Aramaic, and, and for the ones who prayed this way, and, and for the ones who lived that way. We might remember that 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 was written and believed by the very first followers of Jesus. We can read it in the book of Colossians chapter 1, where it says, For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him, Jesus, God was pleased to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, by making peace through the blood of his cross. You see, this saving act is offered without qualification. The death of Jesus is an act of compassion, of mercy, of unthinkable, redemptive love, not just for some, but for all. Have we forgotten that Jesus died for the doubters? That he died for the unbelievers? Have we conveniently forgotten that he died for those who are different than us? Who believe differently than us? Have we so monopolized the love of God that we've limited it to those we deem worthy? My friends, we don't know the ultimate answers to these questions of our faith. But can we not cry out together, save us, Lord? Can we not place our trust, as shaky as it may be, in the one whose love is bigger than the limitations we may place on it? Can we ask, how long will this last, while also trusting that whatever happens, God will love us and redeem us and bring good from whatever we go through? Can we not find it in ourselves to ask, what wondrous love is this that would save me in all of my sin and brokenness? And if God's love would save even me from my very real troubles, then why not you? How long will we claim God's mercy for ourselves and deny it to others? How long? In this moment in our history, when we are brought together in a way by our common affliction, let us remember that we are also met by a common mercy, a common love, the unsurpassable love of a God who saves us and will never abandon us. 
Thanks be to God indeed. Amen. Let us pray. O God of love, as we worship you in this way again, in different spaces, in different times, we offer you our praises and our questions, our songs and our struggles. Lord, as we come to this most holy week, we remember your incredible love and power. We remember your sacrifice. We remember how you chose the way of humility, of, of putting others before yourself. Our worship of you is centered in these stories of saving love and profound grace. So how can we do any other thing than sing your praises? And yet, O oh Lord, our lives are complicated by confusion and conflict and catastrophe. We are all wrestling with the questions of this season, the questions of this situation, the questions of our faith. And so even as we sing of your great love, we also feel the pain of our grave reality. We feel the burden of those who are inflicted with the virus, who are regularly exposed. We feel the pain of those who have lost loved ones. We feel the fear of those who work in the medical field, those who are on the front lines, those whose work is essential, those who, who cannot escape their sense of panic, those, those who feel utterly alone and forgotten, those in hospital rooms without people to visit them, those waiting in cars outside the hospital for news. Lord, these and so many more we pray for. In this moment, we, we long to remember the story of your final days in a new way. We long to hear the tragic sense of your betrayal, the, the intimacy of your final meal, the injustice of your death, and the wild beyond belief claim of your resurrection to life from the grave. We long to hear these stories in new ways and, and with new power that speaks to our reality, that speaks to those for whom we are praying that speaks to our own feelings of fear and anxiety and loneliness. We long to be a part of these stories, not as once upon a time religious fairy tales, but as the deep rooted truth of our faith that impacts how we live right now so that we might live with courage and conviction and concern for our neighbor, embodying the very kingdom that you showed us and taught us to pray for when you taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who've trespassed against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let us sing our closing hymn, What Wondrous Love Is This? What wondrous love is this, O oh my soul, O oh my soul? What wondrous love is this, O oh my soul? What wondrous love is this that caused the Lord of bliss to bear the dreadful curse for my soul, for my soul, to bear the dreadful curse for my soul? What wondrous love is this my soul, oh my soul, what wondrous love is this, oh my soul, what wondrous love is this that caused the Lord of life to lay aside his crown for my soul, for my soul, to his crown for my soul. To God and to the Lamb I will sing.
sing, I will sing to God and to the Lamb. I will sing to God and to the Lamb, who is the great I Am. While millions join the theme, I will sing, I will sing. While millions join the theme, I will sing. And when from death I'm free, I'll sing on, I'll sing on. And when from death I'm free, I'll sing on, and when from death I'm free, I'll sing and joyful be, and through eternity I'll sing on, I'll sing on, and through eternity I'll sing on. As we come now to a time of responding to God's movement in our lives, in our hearts, and in our minds, and in our relationships, I urge you to once again consider how you will respond. Over the last couple of weeks, I've been reminding us that the expenses of our shared ministry together continue. And I have pled with you to continue to make your financial offering either online or by physically mailing it in. Those of you who know me well know how uncomfortable this makes me, as I already feel a bit like a televangelist preaching and talking to a camera, and I'm uncomfortable in a role that feels like I'm asking for your money. But I want to share with you how grateful I am for the response that you have shown. Over the last couple of weeks, your generosity has been truly amazing. Many of you have sent in your gifts or, 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 or given us your pledge in advance, knowing that we, we need some cash flow at this time. Uh, some of you have offered special gifts. Some have anonymously given money to help us through this difficult time. I've received so many notes saying that, that while you don't have extra to give at this moment, that, that you're offering to, to help others, to, to, to be ready to, to, to stand in, to deliver groceries or to do whatever it takes uh, to help our neighbors in this moment. My friends, I cannot express to you how grateful I am to be a part of a faith community that is so determined to come together in this way, to face the uncertain future with, with courage and commitment. We, we have an amazing witness in this way. We are so blessed. And we urge you to continue in this spirit of collaboration and community. You can support us by making an online donation or, or giving through text. And, and those instructions are all on our website. Or you can also mail your gift to us. But, but however you give your financial gift, please know how grateful we are for the way that you have already shown yourselves ready to step up to the challenge. And I also want you to know that the response to which we are all called is not merely financial, but comprehensive and complete. We hope you'll use the discussion questions that are in the, the comment section down underneath uh, this video and, and which were also emailed to you so that this isn't just a, a monologue or, or, or some entertainment on your screen, but an opportunity to, to be in conversation that is lived out maybe around the table or around the, the living room or on the telephone. Let's keep interacting and conversing and checking in on one another and reaching out to those we haven't heard from and having real conversations as we build, build real relationships. And as you consider your response in how you will live, may you receive this blessing. Go into the rest of this day and week with a renewed hope. Go with your questions and your laments held in one hand and your faith and hope in the other. Go as ones who are willing to cry out, Lord, save us while remembering that God's wondrous love is the ultimate remedy. Go in peace. Amen.